Chapter 10, Section 1. Would privatizing banking make capitalism more stable? Jesus, no. It's claimed that the existence of the state, or for minimal statist government policy, is the cause of the business cycle, reoccurring economic booms and slumps. This is because the government either sets interest rate too low or expands the money supply, usually by easing credit restrictions and lending rates, sometimes by just printing fiat money. This artificially increases investment as capitalists take advantage of the artificially low interest rates. The real balance between savings and investment is broken, leading to overinvestment, a drop in the rate of profit, and so a slump, which is quite socialist in a way, as many socialists also see overinvestment as a key to understanding the business cycle, although they obviously attribute the slump to different causes, namely the nature of capitalist production, not that the credit system doesn't play a part in it. In the words of Austrian economist uh, W. Duncan Rieke, the business cycle is generated by monetary expansion and contraction. When new money is printed, it appears as if the supply of savings has increased. Interest rates fall and businessmen are misled into borrowing additional funds to finance extra investment activity. This would be of no consequence if it had been the outcome of genuine saving, but the change was government-induced. The new money reaches factory, uh, factory owners in the form of wages, rent, and interest. The factory owners then spend the higher money incomes in their existing consumption investment proportions. Capital good industries will find their expansion has been an error and malinvestments have been incurred. Markets, Entrepreneurs, and Liberty, pages 68 to 69. In other words... There has been wasteful misinvestment due to government interference with the market. Again, Markets, Entrepreneurs, and Liberty, page 69. In response to this negative influence in the workings of the market, it's suggested by right libertarians that a system of private banks should be used and that interest rates are set by them via market forces. Mm, market forces. In this way, an interest rate that matches the demand and supply for savings will be reached and the business cycle will be no more. But by truly privatizing the credit market, it's hoped by the business cycle will finally stop. Unsurprisingly, this particular argument has its weak points and in this, in this section, we'll try and show exactly why this theory is, well, wrong. Let's start with Riki's starting point. He states that the main problem of the slump is why is there suddenly a cluster of business errors? Businessmen and entrepreneurs are market experts. Otherwise, they would not survive. And why should they all make mistakes simultaneously? It is this cluster of mistakes that the Austrians take as evidence that the business cycle comes from outside the workings of the market, i.e. exogenous in nature. Reiki argues that an error cluster only occurs when all entrepreneurs have received the wrong signals on potential profitability and all have received the signals simultaneously through government interference with the money supply. Mm. But is this really the case? A simple fact is that the groups of rational individuals can act in the same way based on the same information, and this can lead to a collective problem. For example, we do not, uh, we do not consider it irrational that everyone in a building leaves it when the fire alarm goes off and that the flow of people can cause holdups at the exits. Neither do we think it's unusual that traffic jams occur. After all, those involved are all trying to get to work. I, they're reacting to the same desire. Now, it is so strange to think that capitalists who all see the same opportunity for profit in a specific market decide to invest in it, or, or that the aggregate outcome of these individually, individually rational decisions may be irrational, I cause a glut in the market. In other words, a cluster of business failures may come about because of a group of capitalists acting in isolation over-invest in a given market. They react to the same information, namely super profits in market X. They arrange loans, invest, and produce commodities to meet demand in the market. However, the aggregate result of these individually rational actions is that the aggregate supply far outstrips demand, causing a slump in the market and perhaps business failures. The slump in this market and the potential failure of some firms has an impact on the companies that supplied them. The companies that are dependent on their employees' wages and demands, the banks that supplied the credit, and so forth. The cumulative impact of this slump or failures on the chain of financial commitments of which they are built, but one link can be large and perhaps push an economy into general depression. Thus, the claim that something external to the system that causes depression is, well, as typical, flawed. It could be claimed that the interest rate is the problem that it doesn't accurately reflect the demand for investment or relate it to the supply of savings, 
But it's not at all clear that the interest rate provides the necessary information to the capitalists. They need investment information for their specific industry, but the interest rate is cross-industry. Thus, capitalists in market X do not know if the investment in market X is increasing, and so this lack of information can cause malinvestment or as overinvestment, and so overproduction can occur. As they also have no way of knowing what the investment decisions of their competitors are, or now these how these decisions will affect an already unknown future, capitalists may actually overinvest in certain markets, and the net effects of this aggregate mistake can expand throughout the whole economy and cause a general slump. In other words, a cluster of business failures can be accounted for by the workings of the market and not the existence of a government, in fact. This is one possible reason for an internally generated business cycle, but that's not the only one. Another is the role of class struggle, which we'll discuss in the next section, and yet another is the endogenous nature of the money supply itself. This account of uh, money, proposed strongly by others, the post-Keynesian school, argues that the money supply is a function of the demand of credit, which itself is a function of the level of economic activity. In other words, the banking system creates as much money as people need, and any attempt to control that creation will cause economic problems and perhaps crises. Interestingly, though, this analysis has strong parallels with mutualist and individualist anarchist theories on the causes of capitalist exploitation and the business cycle itself. But money, in other words, emerges from within the system. And so the right libertarian attempt to blame the state, again, as as is tradition for right libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists, is simply wrong. Thus, what is termed credit money, created by the banks, is an essential part of capitalism and would exist without a system of central banks, because this is because money is created from within the system. It's in response to the needs of capitalists. In a word, money is endogenous and credit money is an essential part of capitalism. Right libertarians do not agree. Rieke argues that, quote, once fractional reserve banking is introduced, however, the supply of money substitutes with uh, will include fiduciary media, the ingenuity of bankers, other financial intermediaries and the endorsement and guaranteeing of their activities by governments and central banks has ensured that the quantity of fiat money is immense. Previous citation, page 73. Therefore, what so-called anarcho-capitalists and other right libertarians seem to be actually complaining about when they argue that state action creates the business cycle by creating excess money is that the state allows bankers to meet the demand for credit by creating it. This makes sense for the first fallacy of this sort of claim is how could the state force bankers to expand credit by loaning more money than they have savings? This seems to be the normal case within capitalism. The central banks accommodate bankers' activities. They don't force them to do it. Alan Holmes, a senior vice president of the New York Federal Reserve, stated that, quote, in the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. The question then becomes one of whether and how the Federal Reserve will accommodate the demand for reserves. In the short run, the Federal Reserve has little or no choice about accommodating that demand. Over time, its influence can obviously be felt. Quoted by Doug Henwood, Wall Street, page 220. Although we must stress that central banks are not passive and do, and do have many tools for affecting the supply of money. For example, central banks can operate, quote, tight money policies, which have significant impact on an economy and via creating high enough interest rates, the demand for money. It could be argued that because central banks exist, the state creates an environment which bankers take advantage of. By not being subject to free market pressures, bankers could be tempted to make more loans than they would otherwise in a pure capitalist system i.e. Create, uh, create credit money. The question arises, though, would pure capitalism generate sufficient market controls to stop banks loaning in excess of available savings, i.e. eliminate the creation of credit money or fiduciary media? It's, this, it's to this question that we're going to turn now. As noted above, the credit for uh, the demand for credit is generated from within the system, and the comments by Holmes reinforced this. Capitalists seek credit in order to make money, and banks create it precisely because they are also seeking profit. What right libertarians actually object to uh, is the government, via the central bank, accommodating this creation of credit. If only the banks could be forced to maintain a savings to loan ratio of one, then the business cycle would stop. But is this likely? Could market forces ensure that bankers pursue such a policy? Uh, 
<laughs> we, think, we think not, simply because the banks are profit-making institutions. As post-Keynesianist uh, Hyman Minsky argues, because bankers live in the same expectational climate as businessmen, profit-seeking bankers will find ways of accommodating their customers. Banks and bankers are not passive managers of money to lend or to invest. They are in business to maximize profits. Quoted by L. Randall Ray, Money and Credit in Capitalist Economies, page 85. This is recognized by Ricci in passing, at least. He notes that fiduciary media could still exist if bankers offered them and clients accepted them. Bankers will tend to try and accommodate their customers and earn as much money as possible. Thus, Charles P. Kindleberger comments that monetary expansion is systematic and endogenous rather than random and exogenous. It seems to fit far better than the reality of capitalism that the Austrian and right libertarian viewpoint, mania, uh, ma uh, Mania's Panics and Crashes, page 59, and post-Keynesian L. Randall Ray argues that, quote, the money supply is more obviously endogenous in the monetary systems which predate the development of a central bank. In other words, the money supply cannot be directly controlled by the central bank, since it is determined by private decisions to enter into debt commitments to finance spending. Given that money is generated from within the system, can market forces ensure that non-expansion of credit, i.e. the demand for loans, equals the supply of savings? To begin to, answer, uh, to begin to answer this question, we must note that investment is, quote, essentially determined by expected profitability. Philip Arrestus uh, uh, yeah, Arrestus, the post-Keynesian uh, approach to economics, page 103. So uh, investment is essentially determined by expected profitability. This means that the actions of the banks cannot be taken in isolation from the rest of the economy. Money, credit, and banks are essential parts of the capitalist system, and they can't be artificially isolated from expectations, pressures, and influences of that system. Let's assume that the banks desire to maintain a loan, uh, loans to savings ratio of one and to try to adjust, adjust their interest rates accordingly. Firstly, ch uh, firstly, changes in the rate of interest, quote, produce only a very small, if any, movement in business investment, according to at least empirical evidence, and that the demand for credit is extremely inelastic with respect to interest rates. Thus, to keep the supply of savings in line with the demand for loans, interest rates would have to increase greatly. Indeed, trying to control the money supply via, by controlling the monetary base in this way will only lead to large fluctuations in interest rates. And increasing interest rates has a couple of paradoxical effects. Now, according to economists Joseph Stiglitz and Andrew Weiss, in Credit Rationing in Markets and Imperfect Knowledge, American Economic Review, number 71, page 393 to 410, interest rates are subject to what is called the lemons problem, asymmetrical information between buyer and seller. Stiglitz and Weiss uh, applied the lemons problem to the credit market and argued and unknowingly repeated Adam Smith, you know, the father of capitalism, that a given uh, that at a given, uh, given interest rate, lenders will earn lower return by lending to bad borrowers because of defaults than to good ones. If lenders try to increase interest rates to compensate for this risk, they chase away good borrowers who are unwilling to pay the higher rate, while perversely not chasing away incompetent criminal or malignantly optimistic borrowers. This means that an increase in interest rates may actually increase the profitability of crisis as more loans end up in the hands of defaulters. This gives banks a strong incentive to keep interest rates lower than what they otherwise could or should be. Moreover, quote, increases in interest rates make it more difficult for economic agents to meet their debt repayments, Philip, uh, Philip Arrestus again. Which means that when interest rates are raised, defaults will increase and place pressures on the banking system. At high enough short-term interest rates, firms find it hard to pay their interest bills, which cause or increase cash flow problems. And so, quote, sharp increases in short-term interest rates leads to a fall in the present value of gross profits after taxes, quasi-rents, that capitalist assets are expected to earn. Hyman Minsky, Post-Keynesian Economic Theory, page 45. In addition, to, in addition, production of most investment goods is undertaken on order and re uh, requires time for completion. 
as a rise in interest rates is not likely to cause firms to abandon projects in the process of production. This does not mean that investment is completely unresponsive to interest rates. A large increase in interest rates causes a present value reversal, forcing the marginal efficiency of capital to fall below the interest rate. In the long term, interest rate is also pushed above the marginal efficacy of capital and the project may be abandoned. In other words, investments take time and there's a lag between investment decisions and actual fixed capital investment. So if interest rates vary during this lag period, initially profitable investments become white elephants. As Mikhail Kalecki argued, the rate of interest must be lower than the rate of profit. Otherwise, investment becomes, well, pointless. The incentive for a firm to own and operate capital is dependent on the prospective rate of profit on that capital relative to the rate of interest at which the uh, firm can borrow. The higher the interest rate, the less promising investment becomes. If investment is unresponsive to all but very high interest rates, as indicated prior, then a privatized banking system will be under intense pressure to keep rates low enough to maintain a boom by perhaps creating credit above the amount available as savings. And if it does, overinvestment and crisis is the inevitable eventual outcome. If it does not do this and it increases interest rates, then consumption and investment will dry up as interest rates rise and the defaulters, honest or and, uh, and or dishonest, increase and a crisis will, well, eventually occur. This is because increasing interest rates may increase savings, but it also reduces consumption. Quote, High interest rates also deter both consumers and companies from spending so that the domestic economy is weakened and unemployment rises. Paul Omerod, The Death of Economics, page 70. This means that firms can tr face a drop off in demand, causing them problems and perhaps leading to a lack of profits, debt repayment problems, and failure. An increase in interest rates also reduces demand for investment goods, which can also cause firm problems, increase unemployment, and so on. So an increase in interest rates, particularly a sharp one, could reduce consumption and investment, reduce aggregate demand, and have a ripple effect throughout the economy, which could cause a slump to occur. In other words, interest rates and the supply and demand of savings and loans, they're meant to reflect, uh, uh, and demand of savings loans, they're meant to reflect may not necessarily move an economy towards equilibrium, if such a concept is even useful. Indeed, the workings of a pure banking system without credit money may increase unemployment as demand falls in both investment and consumption in response to high interest rates, and then a general shortage of money due to lack of credit money resulting from the tight money regime implied by such a regime i.e. the business cycle would still exist. This was the case of the failed uh, uh, monetarist experiments in the early 1980s when central banks in America and Britain tried to pursue a tight money policy. The tight money policy did not, in fact, control the money supply. All it did was increase interest rates and lead to a serious financial crisis and a deep recession. As Ray noted, quote, the central bank uses tight money, money policies to raise interest rates. This recession must, uh, we must note, also broke the backbone of working class resistance and the unions in both countries due to the high levels of unemployment and it generated as intended. Such an outcome would not surprise anarchists, as this was a key feature of the individualist and mutualist anarchist arguments against the money monopoly associated with specie, uh, specie money. Um, they argued that the money monopoly created a tight money regime which reduced the demand for labor by restricting money and credit and so allowed the exploitation of labor, i.e. encouraged wage labor, and stopped the development of non-capitalist forms of production. Thus, Lysander Spooner's comments that workers need, quote, money capital to enable them to buy the raw materials upon which to bestow their labor, the implements and machinery with which to labor, unless they get this capital, they must all either work at a disadvantage or not work at all. A very large portion of them to save themselves from starvation have no alternative but to buy, uh, but to sell their labor to others. So a letter to Grover Cleveland, page 39. It's interesting to note that workers did do well during the 1950s and 60s under a liberal money regime than they did under the tighter regimes of the 1980s and 90s. We should also note that an extended period of boom will encourage banks to make loans more freely. 
According to Minsky's financial instability model, uh, crisis, see the financial instability hypothesis, in post-Keynesian economic theory, for example, is essentially caused by risky financial practices during periods of financial tranquility. In other words, stability is destabilizing. In a period of boom, banks are happy and the increased profits from companies are, well, flowing into the coffers. Over time, banks note that they can use a reserve system to increase their income, and due to the general upswing, uh, upward swing of the economy, consider it safe to do so. And given that they're in competition with other banks, they may provide loans simply because they're afraid of losing customers to, well, more flexible competitors. This increases the instability within the system. As firms increase their debts due to the flexibility of banks and produces the possibility of crisis if interest rates are increased because the ability of businesses to fulfill their financial commitments embedded in debts deteriorates. Even if we assume that interest rates do work as predicted in theory, it's false to maintain that there's one interest rate. This is not the case. Quote, concentration of capital leads to unequal access to investment funds, which obstructs further the possibility of smooth transitions in industrial activity. Because of their past record of profitability, large enterprises have higher credit ratings and easier access to credit facilities, and they're able to put up larger collateral for a loan. Michael A. Bernstein, The Great Depression, page 106. The larger the firm, the lower the interest rate they have to pay. Thus, banks routinely lower their interest rates to their best clients, even though the future is uncertain and past performance cannot and does not indicate future returns. Therefore, it seems a bit strange to maintain that the interest rate will bring savings and loans into line if there are different rates being offered. Of course, private banks cannot affect the underlying fundamentals that drive an economy, like productivity working class power and political stability any more than central banks, although central banks can influence the speed and gentleness of an adjustment to a crisis. Indeed, given a period of full employment, a system of private banks may actually speed up the coming of a slump. As, we, as will be argued in the next section, full employment results in a profit squeeze as firms face a tight labor market, which drives up costs and therefore increased workers' power at the point of production and in their power of exit. In a central bank system, capitalists can pass on these increasing costs to consumers and so maintain their profit margins for longer. This option is restricted in a private banking system as banks would be less inclined to devalue their money. This means that firms will face a profit squeeze sooner rather than later, which will cause a slump as firms cannot make ends meet. As Riki notes, inflation, quote, can temporarily reduce employment by postponing the time when misdirected labor will be laid off. But as Austrians, like monetarists, think inflation is a monetary phenomenon, he does not understand the real cause of inflation and what they imply for a pure capitalist system. As Paul Ormerod points out, the claim that inflation is always and everywhere purely caused by increases in the money and supply, and that there are a rate of inflation bears a, st a stable, predictable relationship to increases in the money supply is ridiculous. And he notes that increases in the flight of, uh, rate of inflation tend to be linked to falls of in unemployment and vice versa, which indicates its real causes, namely in the balance of class power and in the class struggle. Death of Economics, page 96 and page 131. Moreover, if we do take the Austrian theory of business cycle at face value, we're drawn to conclusion that in order to finance investment savings must be increased. But to maintain or increase the stock of loanable savings, inequality must be increased. This is because unsurprisingly, rich people save a larger proportion of their income than poor people, and the proportion of profits saved are higher than the proportion of wages. But Increasing inequality, as was argued in Chapter 3, Section 1, makes a mockery of right libertarian claims that their system is based on freedom or justice. This means that the preferred banking system of so-called anarcho-capitalists implies increasing, not decreasing, inequality within society. Moreover, most firms fund their investments with their own savings, which would make it hard for banks to loan these savings out as they, would, uh, as they could be withdrawn at any time. This could have serious implications for the economy, as banks refuse to fund new investments simply because of the uncertainty they face when accessing if their available funds, uh, if their available savings can be loaned to others. After all, they can hardly loan out the savings of a customer who's likely to demand them at any time. And by refusing to fund new investment, a boom could falter and turn to slump as firms don't find the necessary orders to keep going. So, 
would market forces create sound banking? The answer is probably not. The pressures on banks to make profits come into conflict with the need to maintain their savings to loan uh, uh, ratio, and so the confidence of their customers. As Ray argues, as banks are profit-seeking firms, they find ways to increase their liabilities, which don't entail increases in reserve requirements. And if banks share the profit expectations of prospective borrowers, they can create credit to allow projects or investments to proceed. This can be seen from a historical record. As Kindleberger noted, the market will create new forms of money in periods of boom to get around the limit imposed on any money supply. Trade credit is one way, for example. Under the uh, monetarist experiments of 1980s, there were deregulation. Uh, there was deregulation and central bank constraints raised interest rates and created a moral hazard. Banks made increasingly risky loans to cover rising costs of issuing liabilities. Rising competition from non-banks and tight money, uh, money policy forced banks to lower standards and increase rates of growth in an attempt to grow their way to profitability. Thus, credit money, or fiduciary media, is an attempt to overcome the scarcity of money within capitalism. Particularly the scarcity of specie money, the pressures that banks face within actually existing capitalism would still be faced under pure capitalism. It's likely, as Ricky acknowledged, that credit money would still be created in response to the demands of business people, although not at the same level as currently the case, I imagine. The banks seeking profits themselves and in competition for customers would be caught between maintaining the value of their business, i.e. their money, and the needs to maximize profits. As a boom develops, banks would be tempted to introduce credit money to maintain as it's increasing the interest rate would be difficult and potentially dangerous for the reasons noted already. Thus, if credit money is not forthcoming, i.e. the banks stick to the Austrian claims that loans must equal savings, then the rise in interest rates required will generate an economic slump. If, it's, uh, if it is forthcoming, then the danger of overinvestment becomes increasingly likely. All in all, the business cycle is a part of capitalism and not caused by external factors like the existence of, say, a government. As Ricky notes to Austrians, ignorance of the future is endemic, but you would be forgiven for thinking that this is not the case when it comes to investment. An individual firm cannot know whether its investment project will generate the stream of returns necessary to meet the stream of payment commitments undertaken to finance a project. And neither can the banks who fund those projects. Even if a bank does not get tempted into providing credit money in excess of savings, it cannot predict whether banks will do the same or whether the projects it funds will be successful. Firms looking for credit may turn to more flexible, flexible competitors who practice reserve banking to some degree, and the inflexible bank may see its market share and profits decrease. After all, commercial banks typically establish relations with customers to reduce the uncertainty involved in making loans. Once a bank has entered into a relationship with a customer, it has strong incentives to meet the demands of that customer. There are examples of fully privatized banks. For example, in the United States, which was without a central bank uh, after 1837, the the major banks in New York were in a bind between their roles as profit seekers, which made them contributors to the instability of credit, and as possessors of uh, uh, country deposits against whose instability they had to guard. In Scotland, the banks were unregulated between 1772 and 1845, but the leading commercial banks accumulated the notes of lesser ones, as the Second Bank of the United States did contemporaneously in the, U in the United States, ready to convert them to specie if they thought they were getting out of line. They serve, that is, as an informal controller of said money supply. For the rest, as so often, historical evidence runs against strong theory, as demonstrated by the country banks in England from 74, uh, 1745 to 1835, wildcat banking in Michigan in the 1830s, and the latest experience with the banking deregulation in Latin America. Um, we should note that there are a few bank, uh, banking wars during the period of deregulation in Scotland, which forced a few of the smaller banks to fail as the bigger ones refused their money. And well, that was major banking failures in the air, uh, in the Iyer Bank. But Kendallberger argued that central banking arose to c control, uh, arose to impose control on the instability of credit and did not cause the instability which right libertarians maintain it does. 
But as will be noted in section uh, section three of this chapter, the the USA suffered uh, suffered massive economic instability during its period without central banking. Thus, if credit money is the cause of the business cycle, it is likely that a pure capitalism will still suffer it from it just as much as the actually existing capitalism, either due to higher interest rates or overinvestment. In general, the failed monetarist exper experiments of the 1980s prove well, trying to control the money supply is impossible. The demand for money is dependent on the needs of the economy and any attempt to control it will fail and well, cause a deep depression, usually via high interest rates. The business cycle, therefore, is an endogenous phenomenon caused by a normal functioning of the capitalist economic system. Austrian, and right ec uh, Austrian economists and right libertarians uh, claim that slump, uh, slump flows boom, but for a totally unnecessary reason, government-inspired malinvestment. They're simply wrong. Overinvestment does occur, but it's not inspired by the government. It's inspired by the banks needing to make profits from loans and from businesses' need for investment funds, which the banks accommodate. In other words, by the nature of the capitalist system. <laughs>